Have you been running a business that is projected to fail because of low returns on investments? Are you a creative entrepreneur that has had your creative masterpieces stolen or copied by others? Maybe you are a person that has reached a place in your journey where you feel like giving up on your goals and objectives. If so, keep listening because in this episode, I will discuss the importance of protecting your brand, name, inventions, and overall creativity, thereby giving you a new outlook on doing business in today's ever-changing marketplace. Welcome to the Educated Natural Podcast. I'm your host, The Educated Natural. This podcast tells the unadulterated truth about the daily journey of being an entrepreneur and content creator. Here, you will find details about intellectual property protection, business positioning, and strategies for your overall success. Now give it up for your host, The Educated Natural. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another season and session of the Educated Natural podcast. I'm your host, The Educated Natural. I am super excited to be bringing today's episode to you today because I have a very exciting guest with me today. Honestly, this beautiful woman here needs no introduction at all. But in case her beautiful face has not been alert enough for you, allow me to tell you exactly who this wonderful woman is. But in the meantime, I want to see if anyone in the chat can tell me who she is or anything about her. But if you can't, let me give you a little bit of a hint. Her name is Fraylene J. Algayer, and she is an intellectual property law attorney out of Illinois. Listen, if you're in the Midwest, you need to put your listening ears on because she is a force to be reckoned with. She is the founder of All Geyer Patent Solutions. You can find that at www.allgeyerpatentsolutions.com. She represents clients throughout the United States who need legal assistance with regards to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Listen, if you are a business professional and you know you need to protect your intellectual property, you need to share this out immediately, especially if you are an inventor. But let me continue on and tell you a little bit more about my featured guest today. She has a BS, which is a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Texas Southern University. Oh, but that's not all. She also has her MS, which is a Master of Science in Biology from Texas Southern University. Hold on to your hats, everyone, because that's still not all. She's earned her JD from John Marshall Law School. Now, if you know anything about law schools, you know about John Marshall. Oh, but that's still not all. She also has practiced before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Now, I told you, this is the Educated Natural Podcast. And as you know, my vow to you is I will never leave you uneducated. So when I tell you I bring the best of the best to the podcast and to any show that I do, you better believe it. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you all about my guest because I want her to tell you about her herself. So everyone join me, put your hands together and welcome attorney Fraylene J. Allgaier. Welcome attorney. Thank you for being here. And thank you for having me, you know, to talk to your to your clients and to discuss their intellectual property needs. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be here. I was telling my other people that I talked to outside of the social media arena that I was super excited to be able to connect with you and have you here because to me, you seem like a unicorn because there aren't many patent attorneys 
there definitely are even less African-American patent attorneys and probably even less female African-American patent attorneys. So I'm super excited to just have you here. Like I literally just want to grab my notebook and just sit back and take notes. Yes. And I would agree with you. It is a unicorn uh, status indeed, but unicorn in, in, in terms of STEM, but not in terms of reachability. So for anyone that is listening with a science degree and engineering degree, this is something that's certainly doable. You don't have to go to law school. So yes, it's all doable. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for saying yes to the opportunity. And also I have to give a huge thank you and shout out to Jay, your brother. And on YouTube, he's known as Juicing with Jay. So thank you, Jay, for making the connection. Yes, yes. He'll be excited to see me here. And I know we're competitive. He's a gardener, but yes. I'm equally, you know, into gardening as well as, you know, as he is. So we're competitive in that regard. So thank you, Jay. Thank you. Oh, wow. So see, my brothers and I are the only ones that are sibling competitors. So I love hearing that. Yeah. So how was it growing up with Jay as your sibling? Um, he's what you see. You know, he's authentic. Uh, he works hard. He's disciplined. Um, he's uh, just as uh, focused at, at home as he is at work. He loves gardening, but he works just as hard, you know, in his professional career. He's always been uh, a hardworking uh, young man. So what you see of Jay today is, is not something that's developed overnight. It's something that he's had his personal, you know, as his personal obligation, you know, uh, with in, in terms of how he does his work, his gardening and, and raising his kids and also, you know, with his wife. So what you see with regards to Jay on his YouTube channel is all uh, always been 100% Jay. So I'm super proud of him. Yes. No, that's great. That is yeah. great to see the love between siblings like that. That is a great, great thing to see. So hi, Jay. Thank you for the connect once again. Now, Attorney Allgaier, there are so many questions surrounding intellectual property, especially in the age that we live in today where it seems like since the issue, let's just call it that, that took over the world in 2020 and still we're still dealing with today, a lot of people seem to have come out of the closet with so much creativity, things that they didn't think they could do prior to the changing of the world. What has it been like for you being a patent attorney? Have you seen an influx of inventions and patent filings or what has life been like for you? I, I agree with you. You know, there's been an influx. It seems like with the uh, lock-in, you know, with families staying in and not just families, but individual inventors, business owners working from home, having a little bit more free time to think, you know, uh, out in, inside of the home. I saw most definitely an influx in uh, clients coming in with uh, ideas. Um, nothing I would say out of the ordinary, you know, uh, you would have ideas relating to um, small mechanical devices from clients, ideas with regards to mobile apps, uh, coping with COVID, using a mobile app, for example, to cope with COVID, developing uh, clothing lines, uh, you know, uh, to sort of represent that lockdown uh, mindset or um, a current status of being in lockdown. So a plurality of ideas sort of rolled in from all over, not just the United States, but also over the you know the world, you know, uh, uh, folks looking to protect um, these ideas and looking to fund these ideas if those funds were not readily available, you know. So yes, most definitely an influx in ideas coming in. Sometimes, uh, at least initially, overwhelming, but I wasn't terribly surprised. You know, I'd heard that some businesses slowed down, restaurants, for example, were closing down while businesses closed all around. I still saw innovation uh, coming in. Yes. Yes, there was a lot of innovation. Even, you know, personally, I started to awaken on the inside with so many different ideas and just like this influx of creativity just took mm -hmm. over me because it's like you didn't have those outside distractions anymore because you couldn't go anywhere. So it, it gave me the opportunity just to kind of reconnect with myself and try different things and definitely gave me the opportunity to study to read up on protecting my own intellectual property. And I must say, I have heard so many stories from other creatives where 
during that this this time we're in now, the things that they created, a lot of people are finding themselves being either copied or stolen from or counterfeited. Have you had to experience that in your office where you've had to be faced with that or fight for another creative's creative masterpieces? Oh, yes. And, you know, I would say that uh, most inventors, let's say they're highly sophisticated, meaning that they had um, an established business um, patents, you know, as a part of their business, they are able to hire attorneys to conduct um, infringement searches, meaning that uh, using the details of a product, let's say, uh, let's say I'm talking to small, a small individual inventor with a, you know, container, a plate or a new design for a, a container. They would search uh, the patent database, the public domain uh, for infringing products. So this infringement search uh, takes some wherewithal, some money, you know, and some uh, expertise to be able to make that determination. So I would say the highly, more highly sophisticated clients can afford these types of services because most attorneys or uh, patent search agencies that offer infringement services you know, would charge uh, upwards a couple thousand dollars, you know, for an infringement search. So on the one hand, you might have an individual inventor with an idea, but no funds, you know, to um, start off, let's say with a prototype, uh, they might have an estimate for a prototype, 50, $60,000 for a prototype, you know, so uh, when you have more sophisticated inventor, they've already invested thousands of dollars in the product, in the marketplace, uh, on the, in the business, they are more likely to then seek out uh, an infringement opinion and then uh, look to cease uh, or stop uh, the production of the infringing product. So just finding out if it's infringing, you know, is a costly uh, process. And I would say for most individual inventors, uh, they'd rather start off with exposing what they have as opposed to protecting what they have. Good yeah. point. Yes, that's that's true. A lot of people want to just put it out there and not protect it. And I think that's what gets a lot of people in trouble because from what I've heard, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, once you put it out there, it's like up, almost like it's up for public grab. And now you're having to fight against the, the ones you're saying are the infringers. Now you have to prove your side versus their side. Could that be a very tedious process based on your experience? It, I, I understand it to be a tedious process, uh, depending on, um, as I mentioned before, more sophisticated clients are likely to protect their intellectual property. But let's say I'm just you know, sort of a, an inventor out, out there uh, without uh, the wherewithal to understand, okay, uh, patent pending, the patent pending process. It is, it, on its face, it might appear tedious. But on my end, what we're able to do is uh, have an intake process of, of you, you know, disclosing exactly what you've done so far and in what capacity. Let's say you're at a beta stage for an app, or let's say you're a uh, drafting stage for a specific idea, or the idea is just in your head. If it's just in your head and you're talking about it, or you're, let's say we're talking about it on this platform, that would not constitute disclosure depending on what the idea is. So based on the law, we can certainly take a look at what you have, what you've disclosed so far, and let you and where are you going with the product and give you a good indication of where you are legally with regards to the status of the product. You know, it's not just how it looks, but it, right. it ultimately uh, what it the final product looks like on the store shelf, okay. you know, in someone else's home. So the idea of what's in your head and what ultimately happens to the product are two different things. And then again, within uh, the A and the B, you know, the finished product and the idea is a legal process for protection that has its own, uh, uh, you know, standards for disclosure. Wow, that's that's amazing. Listen, everyone, if you haven't already, make sure you check out her website is running there across the screen. Once again, that's www allgayerspatentsolutions.com is right there on your screen. Those of you that's able to see us on our podcast channel, which is under the name The Educated Natural. All you have to do is go to YouTube and you can actually enjoy the actual live recording of today's episode. 
Those of you that's listening to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, Our Heart Radio, and whatever your selected podcast platform may be, make sure you check the notes below. All of her information will be there as well as mine. In case you want to connect with either one of us, we welcome you to do so, especially if you want to find out how you can protect your intellectual property, this is where you should go. Now, let's go back, Attorney Allgaier, and let's go back to how you decided and at what point did you decide when you were in college that you wanted to be a patent attorney? I would love to hear your beginning story. You know, when I was growing up, I enjoyed writing and I understand uh, the legal process to include quite a bit of uh, writing, not necessarily dictation but analysis, writing, and in undergrad, I had uh, several opportunities to conduct research at institutions outside of Texas Southern University, for example, at the Environmental Protection Agency and at UC Berkeley, you know, as, as an undergraduate student. So in the process of working, you know, or uh, working or consulting or uh, research, you know, with um, uh, research partners, I would write protocols, uh, papers, in um, uh, scientific presentations, for example, that would require a tremendous amount of writing. And that's always been something that I enjoyed. You know, as a student, uh, for example, at, at Dorsey High School in Los Angeles, I was uh, the editor in chief of the, the school newspaper. And, uh, uh, you know, not only writing, but also competing uh, for uh, in journalism, you know, throughout the Los Angeles area. So in that regard, you know, writing uh, was something that I enjoyed. I enjoyed putting uh, thoughts and ideas to paper, and I thought, okay, a uh, patent attorney would be, uh, you know, given my science background, sitting for the patent bar would be uh, the best um, area of practice for me. It's not highly oppositional, and any opposition is, um, you know, something that could be resolved on paper, you know, based on how my style, my legal right. style, my writing style, you know, in, in terms of presenting, for example, a patent application. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Now I've heard and read that not every attorney that goes to law school goes that extra mile to go into the patent side of things. How did that work for you? Because I know there's like a special exam for patent attorneys that other attorneys don't have to take. Yes. For all the young people listening, for example, if you have a degree in biology, chemistry, let's say you're pre-med, let's say you're in inter interdisciplinary health sciences, let's say you're engineering, what you would do, you, you know, before even going to law school is get your uh, transcript evaluated for, um, or perhaps even if you log on to the United States Patent and Trademark Office and research the requirements for a patent agent, uh, they're uh, provided uh, all of the classes, uh, chemistry, uh, physics, uh, classes that are required uh, chemistry and physics just being two examples of the types of sciences that they're looking for to evaluate your transcript. So you can do your own pre-evaluation and then have your transcript evaluated by the patent office to be able to sit for uh, the patent bar. And then later, uh, if you do attend law school, then become a patent attorney. So the process might seem elusive, but as I mentioned earlier, it is quite, it's, it's much more transparent uh, than you would uh, know you know, but, you know, obviously I'm here to then clarify that it is possible. You know, it just basically starts off with that background, a scientific background. Gotcha. Um, not necessarily that you would have to have the background to write a patent application. But I guess there's this idea that if you're in STEM, that you are perhaps much more able to understand the various types of technologies that would uh, be presented in a patent application. Wow, that's amazing. Now... Is the patent exam much harder and much more in depth than the say your regular bar exam? Okay, so the patent bar exam is is uh, testing uh, sort of um, the types of procedures that would be required for um, a patent application. You know the steps, for example, if we're starting off in the primordial stages of the application. There's a certain uh, amount of a uh, United States code requirements for the application and their code requirements for um, the prosecution of the application before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And there are also procedures required for appealing certain uh, you, you know, uh, examiner opinions with regards to the patent application. So it's more of a procedural exam, you know, uh, focusing on national 
and international uh, patent uh, filings and procedures. So the process is different. In law school, you're studying contracts and criminal law and estates and trusts and corporations, you know, on the law uh, governing uh, these, these types of uh, legal uh, concerns. So the patent office is more concerned with the international and national uh, requirements for uh, the prosecution of patent applications. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Got it. Wow. I just, I didn't know until after, after we had our pre-discussion that patent attorneys had a different exam. I thought that all bar exams were created equal. So thank you for the information. I had no idea. Yes, and most people, you know, would not um, know it, you know, uh, because it's not something, you know, that's highly advertised, you know, and, and as you mentioned before, it's sort of you're a unicorn anyway, so no one knows you exist. And so yeah, <laughs> understanding right. this process is, it's, it's, but it's, it's, the more, if you're interested, it becomes more and more transparent what your um, requirements would be, uh, you know, what a student's requirements would be to enter the process. Wow, amazing. So since taking the, the, the patent exam and starting your practice, what has your legal experience been like? I would say it's, I'm independent, you know, um, I'm independent and every client comes with me for the, for the duration of my career. So for example, if you file a patent application and you're a patent and inventor, there are certain maintenance requirements at, at, at least three intervals during the life of the patent where the, you would, uh, you're required uh, in most cases to have a patent attorney to prosecute certain maintenance documents uh, you know, to, uh, to the patent office. Similar to a trademark where you have certain maintenance requirements and an attorney required to, to, you know, to conduct an analysis of your samples to show your continued use of that trademark is similar with regards to patentability. You know, and if a, a inventor finds uh, that their patent expires, you know, then the patent attorney is then required to revive that patent application. So once you walk into my office, the relationship begins. You know, I wouldn't say it's a highly complex relationship. I start off as simple as possible as, as um, understand to make the process uh, easy, right. you know, for, it might not be easy on my end in terms of prosecution, but certainly giving the inventor the feeling that it's doable, okay. you know, and, and an honest opinion with, uh, with regards to the art. I understand. Art the idea, you know, because sometimes inventors might, you know, might be way, you know, in another uh, uh, sphere in terms of uh, the, something we've never seen before, but we make it as easy as possible. Well, everyone, I hope you have your listening ears on and you have your pens and papers out because now we're gonna go into the session where we're gonna look even deeper into patents because maybe you are an inventor out there, maybe you have this idea and you're just not quite sure as to what your next step should be. And that's why Attorney Allgaier is here with me so that we can get you on the right path and make sure you're taking the right steps to ensure that your patent process is a lot easier than probably you coming up with the idea itself. So Attorney Allgaier, let's say I'm an inventor. I have this great idea. What should my next step be? I would say most definitely talk to a patent attorney um, because you don't want to start talking about the idea. You don't want to sit on the idea. Um, you would want to make sure that the idea is indeed patentable. So the first step is to talk to a patent attorney to find out if you can patent what you have. You're comparing your idea to a patent database of millions and millions of ideas as well as ideas, mm -hmm. uh, not just in the patent database, but also in the public domain, you know, which is mm -hmm. uh, how a patent examiner uh, looks at your idea, which starts off as an idea, ends up on paper, but a patent examiner has provided directives to not double patent, meaning that you're not issued a patent by virtue of coming up with the idea. It goes through an examination process that could last from um, anywhere from six months if you are a, let's say someone 65 or older and are filing a petition to make your application special 
and examined ahead of time. So anywhere from six months to three years of examining. Wow. So you, you know, the patent office or the, a patent examiner could be silent for the first um, three years of submitting a patent application. So given that time frame, the best your best option, if you have an idea, is to start the process. And if let's say we're looking at an ind individual inventor, you know, with um, uh, not a terrible amount of of money or a lot of money, I would say there are opportunities, you know, to still get the ball rolling at the patent office as a patent pending status. But a patent attorney can provide direction the best direction based on your history, based on your current situation, and based on your intent, you know, for, for this idea. Wow, that sounds great. That sounds great. As a patent attorney, I know that you probably approached by many people with ideas and different things of that nature and inventions. How does the person determine it, whether or not their invention is patentable? I would say you. Um, there's no way to make that determination on your own. So this is not something, you know, an inventor should sit at home and say, oh, it's patentable or not, not patentable. Right. Patentability is determined uh, based on the United States code for patent applications. And once you're, if your patent is issued, you're given a patent uh, number, issued patent number and certificate, and it becomes a part of the patent office records by virtue of a process. So if you are, if you have an idea, the first step is to keep it confidential. And if you right. share the idea, sign a non-disclosure agreement, but first talk to a patent attorney um, you know, with regards to the idea, because you could be looking at something that's already invented and you wouldn't uh, file for a patent application. If it calls for a design, you know, and we all know uh, new designs could be new bicycle, new chair. The chair is a new, but the design could be new. Right. So talk to a patent attorney uh, if you're interested and really under first understand uh, the patenting process if you're a pro bono status, meaning that, you know, an, an attorney has evaluated your status to be pro bono, there are classes that are available for individual inventors to complete before coming back to the patent attorney. So there's a process uh, to it. You know, it's a step-by-step -step process. And as far as, uh, you know, your idea, there's an intake process to make sure that your idea isn't just, you know, something that we think is not new but based right. on a series of questions, intake questions, what are the alternatives? Here's your idea, but perhaps you have alternatives to the idea, but you know, not just what you think it, it does at this moment, but what you anticipate um, you know, uh, or having alternative versions of what you have. So for people that are wondering about whether or not their patent is patentable, and they let's say they go the extra mile and they have a proto a prototype mm -hmm. and they contact your office financially what are they looking at when it comes to filing for a patent for their invention okay so typically a prototype um you know given the uspto procedures for patent applications for example you have an idea and you went and you know spent money on a prototype i would say from idea to prototype there's a search missing Right, so you've invested twenty thousand dollars on a prototype, but is that mm -hmm. prototype something you're able to protect? Is that right. prototype that you've created yours, or is it a copy of someone else's idea? Great point. So, right, so once you have that idea, you have to make sure that you you secure a patentability opinion. You know, so you have an idea, write it down. What what's what are the steps necessary to practice this invention? Do I have sketches? Do I have uh, you know, if you made, for example, a prototype at home just to sort of give a body or form to this disclosure of your idea, what is it? What does it do? And we search that idea and give you an opinion to let you know if the direction in which you should move with this product. Should you get a prototype? Should you file a provisional patent application? Should you file a utility patent application? Is it calling for design? Meaning that you've created this uh, handmade prototype 
but you're, you sort of created something that already exists, but it, the style is different. You sort of presented a stylized format that could be protected as a design. So in the first stages of your idea, seek out legal assistance, get an opinion. Is it something you can do? Is it something you can, you know, is it legal what it is that you're doing? And if it is legal, how to proceed in terms of patent pending? You know, I think inventors like that term patent pending, and it's certainly something that's achievable um, depending on the idea at a, at a lower cost. I love that idea. I love that advice as well, because some people want to just jump into it and without doing the research prior to, that could be a lot of time and money wasted. So at what point during the process would they contact you? Is it after they come up with the idea that they go to the attorney then? Or at what point? Because we want to make sure we do things in the right order. Exactly. So as soon as if you have an idea and if you're serious, you know, the, the thing is you do have to want to work with this idea. You know, right. if you like this idea and you're serious about it, you see yourself in business. So really do a self-evaluation as to the idea. Make sure that it's really something that you're, uh, you know, uh, prepared financially for a patent application for, let's say, a provisional patent app for a patent search you know, a patent, patent search, patent application, provisional patent application, and also selling the product. It's not just enough to have a patent. All you know, right. there are, uh, 99, I, would, I want to say 99% of patents in the patent database you've never seen before or heard of before. Right. You know, so the idea, any patent examiner will tell you, you don't have to argue with me left and right about patentability. What are you going to do with this device? Are you selling it? Are you going to make money? Are you going to recoup your costs? You're exactly. going to build a business over it, you know. Right. So that's the first uh, consideration, and not, uh, you know, a patent attorney can provide additional uh, directives with regards to to the idea. I love that idea. I love that idea because even with trademarks, I find out that a lot of people, especially in social media, they think it's okay to just put their hands on other people's things and the creator behind it gets upset. But I like to tell people, if you didn't do at some point your own research on both sides, it could be a battle to the end. And it almost seems like it could possibly lessen the, I don't want to say effectiveness or the power behind the patent, the trademark or et cetera, if you don't do your research first. Because I ran into that myself when it came to my own trademark uh, against the people that just thought, okay, I see it out there. I'll just use it. Not realizing that I had already taken the steps to go and protect my own IP. And now I'm having to tell them you have to take these things down. So for patent wise, if someone finds that something they're working on is being used or copied by someone else. And when they did their research on it, there was no one else that had the idea. What steps can they take if they wanted to contact you about this? What can they expect in that situation if they contact you about an issue like this? You know, well, the USPTO system is a first to file system. You know, right. so I'm, you know, a big um, proponent of get it in the patent office in whatever form you have. You know, and I've seen this over and over again where something goes viral, there's a product that goes viral or someone's using a trademark. And we're not doing this like in the older days, you know, old days in the neighborhood. We're on Facebook right. where the right. whole world sees it. We're on Instagram where the whole world is seeing your product. They're seeing your work. They're seeing your style, you know, how you do things. So I would say that um, I'm, I'm rushing to the patent office on many occasions with information to kind of get that patent pending status moving and also then working towards a prototype and a utility patent application. The provisional patent application is just sort of documents, photographs, or write-up, sometimes screenshots of an Instagram page and a brief description of an Instagram page sent over to the patent office for patent pending status. And we can get that within a matter of minutes, a patent pending status. But that's just a patent pending status that would need development to what your goals are for this product. You know, and I would say a patent, a provisional patent application, let's say you submitted a prototype or a photograph or, you know, we're not talking trade uh, trademark, we're talking a product, a photograph of a product submitted as color to the patent office. 
a provisional patent application is not examined. Uh, an examiner does not take a look at the information. What happens is the documents, your photographs, your description are kept in a docket, patent pending docket for 12 months until you're able, uh, you know, 12 months maximum until you're able to file a full patent application with the appropriate patent drawings and description claiming utility, you know, provisional to that, uh, claiming priority to that uh, provisional patent application. I'm so glad you brought up uh, provisional applications because there seems to be like this, I guess, a discrepancy or an argument or so, or confusion, definitely, about the difference between provisional and non-provisional applications. So if you could go a little bit deeper into that, because I want to clear up that discrepancy between the two. Okay, so provisional patent application is more where your idea, you're in the idea phase. You okay. come to my office, or oh, attorney Allgaier have an idea for this product, you know, no prototype. It's just sort of an idea. I do an intake um, where you describe the idea and um, you can sketch out the idea. And those sketches and photo, you know, sketches, photographs, and description of your product are submitted to the patent office as an idea. So we try to get as close as possible to what the final product would be to be able to claim priority to that product. Let's say your new idea is a new chair, but all I did was submit a sort of a, a flat surface to the patent office. Obviously there's a difference between what I submitted and what you ultimately right. came up with. So we try to create something as close as possible to what you anticipate this product to be, to be able to say, you know, this is a proper priority claim. Uh, you know, right. to, the, to your provisional patent application. So a full utility patent application would be sort of what you fully anticipated that product to be. And a provisional patent application is more of the idea phase. So valid only for 12 months. And within that period, you can use that period to advertise your product, to prototype and start marketing your product within that 12 month period. But most clients would need to know that it takes approximately six to eight weeks to write up a full utility patent application. So you're not running into my office on the last day of, right. of that 12 month period. You would have to give an attorney, at least for me, six to eight weeks to write up that patent application. Great advice, great advice. I hope everyone is paying close attention to what attorney Allgaier is telling us today, especially if you are an inventor because you don't want to fall on the wrong side of the, the USPTO. You don't want to lose your invention because of your fatal mistake. So she has given out some great, great information to us all for free 99. So listen, <laughs> pay attention because this is an actual patent attorney, okay? And if you've ever had to contact an attorney, you know their fees are not on the low low. So please, please, if you have questions about the process, if you have questions about patents, I encourage you to leave them below wherever you're seeing this video or listening to this audio. Please feel free to contact her. I'm gonna give her a moment now to tell you how you can contact her and get you all on the right road to success when it comes to your inventions, your patents, your trademarks and your copyrights. So please, Attorney Allgaier, please tell everyone how they can contact you. You can contact me at any time at my website, Allgaier Patent Solutions. I do provide um, free uh, initial phone consultations uh, where we can discuss your idea uh, by virtue of you filling out an intake form and a non-disclosure agreement. We're able to discuss the financial framework for your uh, patent application. I do refer uh, clients to, for example, the Chicago inventors organization here in the Chicago area. It's an uh, African American, used to be an all African American inventors organization. It's since grown. They have a vast, um, re they have resources for inventors um, with regards to uh, possible licensing, for example. But for the most part, the Chicago inventors organization provides counsel uh, in sort of um, with other inventors you know, where you can exchange ideas, uh, talk about where you are in the patenting process, where you are in the, you know, without necessarily sharing if uh, your idea, without, you know, first signing a non-disclosure agreement. Right. So they're in the business of helping inventors. So sometimes I refer clients to the Chicago Inventors Organization, depending on how serious they are 
about um, the idea. It doesn't. You don't have to be serious to call me with your idea. You could just be in the idea phase and need some guidance on what to do. You know, or perhaps you've seen the product. You already have a patent, and you see a product in interstate commerce, something that's very similar. Whether it's a trademark, there are you know uh, possibilities for trademark as well. You, you're using a trademark, but then you see someone else using the trademark. These are all uh, concerns for not just you, but a lot of business owners. So, you know, feel free to contact me for a free consultation to discuss these ideas and what uh, the best steps would be, you know, to sort of secure your IP. If you have a logo that you've been using that you did not protect, if you have artwork, for example, you know, these are all uh, areas of intellectual property. Perhaps there's a, a product that your hair product, for example, or a, a food item of food, everything is, is protectable if you're offering something new in interstate commerce. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Attorney Allgaier, for sharing your information with us. Now, everyone, make sure you head over to her website that she's already told you all about. And those of you that's watching this live on YouTube or in the pre-recorded format, make sure you pay attention to her website that is flowing across the screen, as you can see there. Just in case you forget after you hear this episode where to contact her. And of course, something goes wrong and you completely forget who she is and where you can find her, you can always reach out to me at www.theeducatednatural.com. And of course, on all social media platforms, I am there as The Educated Natural as well. Now, Attorney Algar, you got to mention your social media because, you know, everybody's on social media. Yes, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And um, I'm on YouTube, but most importantly, just call, you know, just pick up the phone and call. I'm old, old school in that regard. And yes. I know how sensitive, you know, business owners are with regards to their information and the need to be taken seriously in, in portraying or describing, you know, or just right. sort of, yeah, trying to uh, put that message across that, look, I have something new and this is what I need to do. So picking up the phone to call is also the best, one of the best options for me. That sounds great. And you can find out her contact information as well on her website. We don't want to give that too much out on the interwebs, but we want you to make sure you go over to her website. And that way you can find out a lot of details about her, her educational background and everything in between. So make sure you reach out to her ASAP sooner rather than later. Your ideas matter. Yes. Now we're going to give attorney Allgaier a moment to sip her coffee and me to get some water so we can hydrate before we go into the next session here on the show. So enjoy this commercial break and we'll be right back. Okay, everyone. Welcome back to the Educated Natural Podcast. We are here with none other than my featured guest of today's episode, attorney Freeline J. Allgaier. I am so excited to have her here. Listen, if you missed the first half of the show, hit that re rewind, replay button so you can make sure you catch up on all the great nuggets she has dropped so far as it pertains to your intellectual property, more specifically patents. So if you are an inventor out there and you know you have an idea that you need to get protected, wait no longer. Uh, contact her right now fast as you can run. Matter of fact, faster than you can run. Make sure you connect with her immediately so she can help you get on the road to patent success. Okay. So we've been talking about patents, but I'm reminded that attorney Allgaier hasn't told us about her, her beautiful family. We want to know about her and let's just get all up in her business in this session. Okay. So, <laughs> Attorney Allgaier, tell us about you, your family, and everything in between. Well, we live here, been, you know, we've been here in the Chicago area for about 24 years. We moved here from Texas. I have three children, and uh, two, two, one finished college, Indiana University. My son was a cadet at West Point, but transferred oh, nice. to the University of Illinois. And I have one uh, girl, eight, uh, 17, she's in high school. She's a junior in high school. Yes. So three children and um, yes, and a loving husband. <laughs> now, you told me during our pre-talk that your husband's a doctor. Yes. What field of doctor is he? My husband is a neonatologist. So he, wow. um, you know, obviously did a pediatric residency. 
Right. And okay. now a neonatologist. And uh, we met actually in Texas. I was a, a research um, student at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, near Texas Southern University. And that's where we met when I was in college. And uh, he was uh, had finished residency and was working on his uh, fellowship in neonatology. And that's how we met. And we've been- Wow. Yes. So how long have you all been married? We've been, I would say, um, you know, more on uh, dating, you know, we're married, but been together for about, I would say 29 years. Nice. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank now, you so thank you. Big, big that I have women that are single on my show. This is going to be their shot. Being that you are married to a doctor, does he have any brothers for the single ladies? <laughs> <laughs> he has a brother, but you know, I don't think his brother is available. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so ladies, he's also a doctor, a psychiatrist. Uh, but I don't, I don't think he's available. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, ladies, so y'all can stop trying to contact me when y'all see this. And she's married to a doctor. Does he have any brothers? Because that has happened before here on the show, attorney. People have seen my guests and it's like, do they have any relatives that, because good gracious, I'm looking and I'm like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, tried. I've tried to make him available. He's not available. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, that's great. Um, I have two brothers. Anybody want them? I'm just playing. They're, gonna get me for that. <laughs> They're so going to get me for that one. Uh, but um, yes, I am honored to have you here and to learn so much about your family and your wonderful kids and your practice. How did you know it was time for you to go independent and start your own practice? Because that seems like a big step. I knew that um, my clients, you know, I knew I would have clients. I knew right. that you know, I could um, have the independence, most importantly, the independence. And as a, as a mother, you know, of, of three children, I think the independence is, is priceless, you know, ownership of, of my business, my brand. Uh, so the first thing I did was to obviously protect my brand because I knew that it would um, create something special, especially for, um, as an African-American, you know, uh, understanding, um, you know, how we are in terms of, of business and uh, our style our, uh, of innovation and of interest in business. I mean, I knew that my clientele wouldn't just be African-American, but initially I thought for sure I would have a substantial amount of business owners and inventors, uh, you know, to take advantage of my expertise. So I knew the independence would be profitable. That's great. That's, that's a great, that's a great thing because I'm sure you probably get approached and contacted by so many people. So my next question kind of goes into what you just said. Mm -hmm. Who do you typically work with? Like some attorneys only work with corporations and some only work with small business owners and so on and so forth. Who do you typically work with? I would say that the majority of my clients are, um, I would say small businesses. Okay. You know, I have a, a good amount of individual inventors, a good uh, number of, of corporations, but um, small businesses, you know, are my, my clients. For example, owners of, I would give you a typical would be, for example, the owner of uh, a food chain, for example, okay. you know, selling um, specialty uh, type foods or teas, you know, drinks things of that sort. So small business owners would fit right in the middle, you know, of, of an average client or, 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 you know, that would uh, call my office for, let's say a trademark or to protect something that they're selling. Yes. Okay. For those that are just now tuning in who may not be familiar with what patents are, there seems to be a lot of confusions when it comes to the different pillars of intellectual property from copyrights, et cetera. Can you please break down the difference between the pillars of intellectual properties for those who may not be familiar with what all of this means? I would say, you know, if I were to clarify anything, um, I think for patents, let's say, you know, it's fairly straightforward. I think most people would understand that a patent could be any new, for example, a new article of manufacture, an article mm -hmm. of manufacture with a, a new uh, style of clothing or small mechanical device or handheld device or a new type of alarm system or air conditioner system or anything, so, even something related to something that you can use. 
that would be patents. But the most confusing, I think, for most, um, I would say, um, people looking to protect something would be trademark. I think just knowing or understanding what can be trademarked, how to present a trademark uh, to the trademark office, mm -hmm. how to uh, you know obtain trademark protection um, and for the trademark office to meet you where you are in terms of your preparedness to use that trademark and also to prove use of that trademark i think becomes the most confusing for a lot of for a lot of people uh, they might not have an invention but they might have a trademark uh, in the form of for example words or uh, some people might associate trademark with um, a design of some sort you know where uh, the mcdonald's golden arches but how does the mcdonald's golden arches um, relate to a word or a design so there's always that confusion as to what to protect, when to protect it, right. how to protect it, and what do I need to do to prepare myself for that protection? And how does the trademark office follow? Is the trademark office involved in, in what I'm doing with this trademark? How do they know if my samples are authentic, if my website is authentic? Is my social media page enough? Is Instagram enough? Are the products shown on my Instagram page enough? So there is a confusion. I think the most confusing would be trademarks. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Because yes. <laughs> even just researching <laughs> trademark, just for yeah. my own yeah. knowledge base, yes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion with trademarks. A whole lot of confusion. You know, with regards to patentable, you can hold an object in your hand. You know, uh, let's right. say you have a, you know headphones or something. You have it in your hand. You're looking at it, and you understand how it works. You know, so there's a finality in that. In terms of trademark, then there's always uh, something coming in from left field. I thought my samples were enough, or I thought this was enough, or that, or I thought I can do it by myself. You right. know, it looked pretty straightforward, but it has its own, you know, levels of complexity. And I would say that's the most confusing. Now, would patents be like on the more expensive scale as far as protection and cost versus, let's say, trademarks and even copyrights? Patents can be 20 times more expensive than, I would say, than the trademark, yes. Whoa. <laughs> patent attorney, an average patent attorney in the United States can be anywhere from $750 to $1,500 an hour. You know, and, and put it this way, uh, you know, a utility, let's say small, you invented a pencil and you're right. coming into the office, you know, an average patent attorney would charge any, you know, would, would give you an estimate for at minimum 20 hours to 40 hours to write up a patent. So those are the average. So for a trademark application, I believe the average price for a trademark application could be anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000. So I would say it's about 10 times uh, more expensive than um, filing for, you know, as far as I understand what the average um, business owner inventor would pay for in the United right. States. So how many patents with those prices, how many patents would you say you do like in a year? I would say 20 or so, I would about 20 patents a year. And uh, that's 10% uh, of, of, of clients, I would say, moving forward, that between 10 to 20%. So I would have been introduced right. at least- Your eight internet kind of went out just oh, for a second. Can sure. you repeat that? Okay, I would say, for example, um, uh, 20 patents filed per year is is more a uh, result of a, a sort of a 10% um, decision, you know, uh, of, of, of inventors deciding to move forward. So I would have been approached by 50 to 100 inventors that one year with regards to, you know, moving forward with something right. or another. Yes. So everyone pay attention. If you're thinking about filing a patent, make sure you have your coins all the way together. Or at least an understanding of what the process, you yes. know, would, would be. So we're talking about uh, corporations. We can also talk about what it would look like for realistically, right, for an individual right. inventor. Yes, who is differently positioned financially than, you know, a corporation. Right. Right. Now that we know that you're located in the great state of Illinois, are you able to help people outside of Illinois, like on a global level with that? Okay, so thankfully, patentability, the concern of whether, uh, you know, a client's um, idea, whether it's trademark, copyright, or a patent, these are all federal questions. 
you know, so an attorney um, can work with uh, clients throughout the United States and be contacted from clients in other countries to be able to prosecute uh, patent, uh, trademark, or copyright applications. So I work with clients not just in the Chicago, actually a majority of my clients are outside of the Chicago area. Okay. I receive contact uh, from clients all over the world and also uh, throughout the United States on a regular basis. And they all have the same question. You know, can you work with me? Because I went down the street to this attorney right. and I saw a law office. It's not just any law office that can that can help you. You know, it's, uh, especially with regards to patentability, it's a specialty. So you do have to work with a patent attorney and that patent attorney can live uh, anywhere in the United States. It's a federal process. Well, everyone, you heard it here first. If you have an idea and you want to patent that idea, she is definitely available to work with you. So what are you waiting for? Go to www.allgeierpatentsolutions.com. Right there on your screen, those of you that's watching us on YouTube and wherever else the video is available at. And for those of you that are listening to us on your favorite podcast episode, make sure you check the description box for all of her information because you don't want to delay. Your ideas need to be protected. Your intellectual property, period, in today's marketplace needs to be protected regardless of the cost, because if it means that much to you, you want to protect it. I've always told people, you have to look at your inventions, your slogans, whatever it is you want to trademark, copyright, trade, uh, patent, trade secrets, whatever it is you want to protect, you have to treat it almost like your children. What level are you willing to go to to protect your children. You have to look at your intellectual property in the same way, because if you don't protect it, someone will feel that it is okay by you, that they can go and copy it, confiscate it in any way possible, especially in today's marketplaces in the social media era. So make sure you're taking the appropriate steps to protect what belongs to you. Attorney Allgaier, we're in the last five minutes of the show, and I want to give you an opportunity to speak to those possible college students, maybe even high schoolers that may be actually interested in intellectual property law. What advice would you give to those students that may be listening to this episode? I would advise those students to reach out, you know, to uh, patent attorneys in their area. Um, don't be afraid. There's a, the USPTO holds um, a database and it's searchable by state um, patent attorney uh, listings. So if you visit the USPTO's website, um, you know, there's a, a, a list of attorneys listed on those websites by state. You should feel the emails are provided, uh, work locations are provided. Feel comfortable reaching out to those attorneys and, um, you know, uh, seek out advice on what the process is seek out a mentor, you know, talk to someone on a regular basis. Do not feel discouraged if someone doesn't return your email or return your phone call. Most patent attorneys are busy. Yes. They have work, um, you know, uh, obligations, uh, requirements with regards to how they spend uh, their eight to five working for uh, especially bigger firms. So, you know, uh, take that into consideration, but don't feel discouraged. Uh, reach out to attorneys, find a local inventors organization in your area, find out how you can volunteer to start learning the process to start interacting with inventors to see how they carry themselves, what their interests are, you know, as what you mentioned earlier, how they value their intellectual property, how they treat it. And you will find that most inventors do indeed carry around their IP like children. <laughs> they, they, you know, they spent a tremendous amount of resources, some inventors to create the ideas. I, I would hate to say some later stage inventors, some older inventors sometimes cash out retirement uh, funds, uh, you know, to build. So we're sensitive to that, um, you know, to this reality as it comes to inventors, you know, uh, the sensitivity of the, the nature of, of what they have and how they value uh, these ideas. So feel free to volunteer, you know, in your area, a local uh, inventors organization. If there's not one in your area, find one, reach out to the directors and see, you know, perhaps you can join in on Zoom calls, join in on their weekly meetings and learn, you know, uh, what will inventors do with the idea, especially individual inventors without a, a you know, LLC or a, a company, you know, what do they do with the idea? How do they get these ideas to the marketplace? So it, 
you know, I would say for a high school student, it's a good opportunity to also be innovative in terms of how to get, how to help, uh, you know, or come up with creative ideas and, and marketing, not just uh, patent attorney uh, work, but also how to, you know, what's the ultimate, um, you know, the idea is to make money, you know, from the product. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am super excited that you you took the time out of your very busy day to spend it here with me, The Educated Natural, on my podcast, The Educated Natural Podcast. I am so honored. The nuggets you have dropped, the level of information you have given out today has been so phenomenal that I can't even find the right word to even describe it. But I am so honored for you just to take the time to educate us. Because that's one thing that I absolutely try to drive home with my listening audience and people that I meet on an everyday basis, the importance of education. And attorney Allgaier, you have done just that. You have educated me. I know you're going to educate the audience. You have made me want to go research and read even more. And I always tell people I'm always a student. So I absolutely thank you for taking the time to educate us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Any final words you would like to give out to the audience today and let them know once again how they can contact you? Yes, my website, you know, allgaierpatentsolutions.com and just pick up the phone and call if you'd like to schedule a free consultation. I send you an NDA, get your email address, send you an NDA to sign and we can talk about your invention. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Make sure you contact her at her website, www.allgaierpatentsolutions.com. Oh www and if you're on social media, which I know a lot of you are, make sure you follow her on whatever social media platform from Facebook to Instagram. She is really blowing up over there on Facebook. I saw your page the other day. I said, oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> but I do as a media person, it would behoove me to ask you, you have to make more videos. You're just too beautiful not to. I'll try, I'll give it a try. You know, <laughs> it takes a lot of time. This is perhaps something, you know, that I could use a young student to do. I, I've had students approach me to help me out, you know, making videos here and there. So thank you so much. I've seen a, quite a few of your videos as well. So you've done thank well you. on your end, just the same. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. You know, I'm gonna have to talk to Jay. I'm gonna have to tell, I'm gonna have to tell Jay to come <laughs> over there and pinch you and say, look, exactly. get your sister on camera. Exactly. <laughs> me as well. He, yes, Jay. He helped me as well. Yes. That's great. That's thank great. So well, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you, everyone that's tuned into the show. I encourage you to share this out. If you ever want to reach out to the show and you would like to sit right here in the same seat with my featured guest today, all you have to do is go to www.theeducatednatural.com. Hit that contact link. Reach out to me. We will have our discussion and we will see about getting you on the show. As you know, this is the Educated Natural Podcast. Every new episode is released all over the podcast platforms every Thursday afternoon. And every show has you in mind. And of course, we make sure that we give you the information you need in a timely manner that you need it. And you can apply it not only to your business, but to your everyday life. Until the next time we are allowed to come together, remember, be sown, be rooted, and above all, be blessed. Stay educated, everyone. I'll see you next time. God Thank bless. You.